Christ, I suspect that might be, I hope that's you, counting on God's mercy, counting on it, and God's grace. So uh, if people who don't see it, well, maybe they're scripture deficient. Maybe they're not saved. Uh, Maybe they're not depending on God for his mercy. So it's not in their thinking wherewithal. Well, if we look at uh, our first scripture this morning, it'll be on the screen here. Jude chapter 1. By the way, a lot of these scriptures are in your bulletin. That one is not. Jude 1, or Jude 1, 21. It's not June. It's Jude. Jude 1, 21. It says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking for the mercy. That's a biblical command. You can look at it as a command and instruction, but God's word is telling us, God wants to tell us to keep looking, keep looking for the mercy that I have for you. Um, So seeing it, like the pilot saw the tower, is dependent upon us knowing that it's there and knowing the value of it and knowing that it's a supernatural thing that God gives to us. Um, so we want to be with Christ, and we, want, we count on Christ. Therefore, we have a relationship with Christ, and that relationship includes the mercy of God. If we look at Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man who, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, the, the ESV calls, counts no iniquity instead of no guile. Some of that old King James language there. Um, further, not only did Christ become sin for us, which makes us unguilty, unguilty, if we believe in Christ as our personal Savior, but God gives us direction in our lives, day to day, hour by hour. He gives us discernment. He helps us make decisions. That's on the basis of a Christian's relationship with God. There's no fear, there's no condemnation, but as instruments of righteousness, according to Romans chapter six. So in Psalm 32, verse eight and nine, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. We used that scripture in Sunday school here a couple of weeks back. So God's up there and he's watching us. He's using his eye. He knows what's going on. And for us to say, well, God, you're up there and I'm down here and you don't really know what's going on. No, God says, I guide you with my eye. And that's good. That's good news to the believer because we have that relationship with him. We count on him. We count on him to give us his mercy. Now, the unsaved person, the person running from God, he he doesn't, oh, I don't want God watching me. I don't want that. So we count on that. We count on it. Uh, Verse 9, be ye not as the horse, nor as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. So that is the truth based on God's word, which is the truth, and it tells us about God's mercy and our relationship with him. In Psalm 32, verse 10 and 11, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass about him. I I made mercy big, bigger letters. Mercy shall compass about him. That's it. That means it's present with us. It's here, but There's qualification there. It says, he that trusteth in the Lord. He that trusteth in the Lord. Mercy shall compass about him. Now, does that mean God has no mercy for the unsaved? Oh, he's got plenty of mercy for the unsaved. Because his mercy is, he's reaching out and he's called, he called me, he called you. Out of his mercy. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to everlasting life. But the word here is referring to 
Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass about him. Verse 11, that same chapter, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Now, would somebody who's not upright in heart want to shout for the joy with Jesus Christ? I haven't seen a lot of that. In fact, I'm not sure I've seen any of it. A person who's going to shout for joy and, and rejoice has a relationship with God, knows God, knows His power, knows His plan for us because He gives us His will day by day. His word is a light, a lamp. So that is a person who's going to be counting on that and mercy encompasses that person. So be glad in the Lord. Now a couple of questions. Do you and I believe that? Do we really believe that? Is that built into our thinking system in our heart so that it's real, so that it's genuine? If an issue comes up in life, do we go to pieces when something, oh, oh what am I going to do, what am I going to do? No, if, if, if we have peace with the Lord, we just turn to God. Dear God, show me, guide me. Thank you for this, Lord, for it will draw me closer to you. And that's where God wants us. And, and he has his grace, he has his mercy, and he gives that to us. So do we see God's provision of mercy in our lives in a day-to-day -day basis? When everything's great, when everything's not so great. It may be great at God's eyes because his mercy, he's going to pull us closer to him. But the psalmist is talking about being glad. Now, if we move six psalms later to Psalm 38, verse 1, let's see what Psalm 38 says. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Whoa! That's a change of gears. That changes gears. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. More of that King James language. Some of the other versions say, your hand presses me hard. So here's David, who wrote a big chunk of the book of Psalms, and, and he is talking about rejoicing and praising God. Now, now he's saying, oh God, don't rebuke me in thy wrath. Let's see where that goes. Psalm 38, verse 10. Let's drop down to verse 10. Here's David. My heart panteth. My strength faileth. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. Wow, that's a different tune. Same David as chapter 6. Does he sound like he's toast? Is he giving up? Why does he say that? Let's look at verse 10 more closely. He's saying, I, David, don't even have the wherewithal to get through life alone independent of God. I can't do it. My strength's gone. My heart pants if I'm apart from you. It's gone. Why would David say that? Why would David be admitting that? Because he knows the truth. Verse number 15, same chapter. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me, for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Now God gave David the discernment to know that he was sinned. He wronged God. He wronged himself. He may have wronged other people, which he did, the Scriptures tell us. And David is recognizing that, and he's coming to grips with that, and he's confessing that to God. Oh, Lord, I hope in you. I hope. I know you'll hear me. Oh, Lord, my God, I'm ready to halt. No more of the sin stuff. I'm sorry. I declare it unto you, Lord. David had to have a relationship with God in order to do that. The person you and I know and the person you and I used to be before we were, we were saved, we committed a sin, oh, let's move on to the next sin. 
Doesn't bother me. Oh, let's move on to the next sin. Doesn't bother me. Now, David was repentant. David was repentant. And we as believers understand that. We know. We know that God is there. He's guiding us with his eyes. And he's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to maintain that relationship with him. Verse 21. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God. Be not far from me. David says, oh, don't, don't. Oh, get away from me, God. I need you. Stay close. Stay close. Make haste to help me. Hurry up. Oh, Lord, my salvation. David clearly reveals his relationship with God. Even though he was in sin, he confessed it. He's coming clean with God. Clean with God. That's where God God wants you and me. Now, I know nobody in here has ever sinned. But in case you ever thought of it, you know God's there already. Okay? You know I'm kidding. Sin's probably not something to kid about, but forgive me. Okay. Here we go. What was that? <laughs> so if we look at, I'm going to go back to, now to Psalm 32.10, be the next slide. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord. Mercy. David recognized his sin and turned to God because of the mercy of God. He knew God wanted him. He knew God wanted him to repent. He had a relationship with God. He counts on God's mercy. He trusts in the Lord. Mercy shall encompass about him. That's why David was ready and so quick to confess that and come clean with God, clean with God. That's what he wanted. So instead of seeing God condemning him, he saw God like this, just like the symbol on the wall over there. He saw saw Christ like this, welcoming him, wanting him to come back, wanting him to repent, Wanting him to restore the relationship. When you and I fall into sin, Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who walk in Christ, who, who, who are saved, who know the Word. No condemnation. And David knew that. David knew that, even in Old Testament time. So Christ is there ready. You and I don't look at God as a big policeman in the sky with a stick. I'm going to come down and get you. I'll watch you with my eyes. And as soon as you step out of line, I'm going to get you. No, that's not the way we see God. We see God as a God of grace with mercy. With mercy. Like the prodigal son and the father welcoming the son back. That's the God we know. That's the Christ we have as our Savior. And so we don't look at that. We confess. We want to come clean. That's our heart. We don't see God as one who condemns. We see God as one who has mercy. And so did David. David confessed. He had to know and see God's mercy. If he would have been flying an airplane, I don't suppose David had an airplane, but if he would have been flying an airplane and that mercy of God was on a radio tower symbolized by the light, David would have seen that. He would have seen that. Because David loved God. And he counted on his mercy. That's where he calls us. Mercy is either seen or unseen. Believers in Christ see that mercy. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, but when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord. So the scriptures not only tell us that God has an eye on us, but we have an eye on us. It says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
But when we are judged, God isn't up there with His great big stick. He chastens us. He wants us to understand. He wants us to see Him as a God of mercy, calling us back, wanting us to repent. And yes, God sometimes will have to put us through the mill to get our attention. He can do that. But He's doing it not to be mean. He's doing it out of mercy. The mercy of God. The mercy of God. So, when it says we should not be condemned with the world, put that back up one more time, uh, Sally, when, on verse, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, there. Um, oh, did I have, is that, do I have 31, 32? Okay, my, my notes are confusing here. He says that we should, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And the last part of that is that we should not be condemned with the world. We should not be condemned with the world. Who's this world? Who's this world that gets condemned? It's non-believers. It's people who don't see the radio tower. It's people who don't see Christ. It's people who don't count on the mercy of God. And there's a condemnation. Why would a big God, a loving God, allow somebody to be condemned? Well, that person's already rejected God. They've rejected Christ. I don't want you, God. Don't you come into my life. You put your sunglasses on. Don't you look at me. And I'm going to go out of my way to avoid your eye on me, God. I'm not going to read your word. I'll show up to church on Christmas and Easter because it's the respectable thing to do. But I don't want you in my life, God. Don't push that Christ stuff on me. So what's God do? That person has condemned themselves. Romans 8, 1 says, no condemnation to, to who? The believer in Christ. The believer in Christ. Now, so if there's a condemnation, God still has mercy, and he's calling that person back because he's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to everlasting life. So mercy is not out the window for the non-believer. But there are many, many places in the scriptures that say when you believe for those who are called, those who trust in God, here's the benefit. And so the relationship that a believer in Christ has with God and the relationship with a non-believer in Christ with God, oh, those are two different things. Two different things. And I've witnessed to people, so have you, who are not saved, and don't want to hear anything about God because they see God as an unmerciful God. Why, why did this bad thing happen to me? Why would a good God make, let a bad thing happen? How many times have you heard that? You know what? The bad things that happen are the mercy of God. They're the mercy of God. Because that's God's horn. That's his blinking light. That's him calling you. Hey, you can't handle things down there, can you? Come to me. Come to me. And somehow, the Lord would get his word across to that person. Maybe a friend. Maybe something on radio, TV. Maybe a billboard. Something they heard. Maybe they got a Bible and they go pick it up. Have you had anybody tell you that it was unsaved? I, I just was to my wits end. I don't know what else to do. And I, I, I looked around and found my Bible and started reading it. I've had people tell me that. God's a God of mercy. God is a God of mercy. People who don't see that, don't believe that, don't want to hear that, they have been schnookered by Satan, John 12, 40, from not reading and knowing the Bible. There's no reason in America not to have a Bible in most countries. No reason not to have a Bible. Kathy, I wonder how many Bibles we have around our house. Actually, we do some of the inventory for the Gideons, so we probably have a few hundred. They're in boxes, so. We don't read them all either, but we do read ours. <laughs> um, the Holy Bible distinguishes believers in Christ and the world 
who does not believe in Christ. It makes a distinction. They're, the two are not the same, and God doesn't deal with them the same. But God, God does call us. He's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's look at Psalm chapter 25, verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. There you go. So I ask you and me, is the path, if I'm unsaved, if I'm not following Christ, if I don't care about God, if he's just off to the side somewhere, is his mercy and truth alive to me? It says here, unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. The paths of the Lord. First of all, God's not going to run us down a path that's not his. So if we're walking a path that's not the Lord, we're not going to count on God. We're not going to trust in God. We're not going to believe in God. And I'm not even going to be aware of the truth if that's me. Neither are you. Not even aware of it, much less care about it. As though as keep his covenant and his testimonies, which is to say, believes God's word and counts on it. Counts on it. So those people who do not are by choice avoiding God. John 3.16, probably it's not on the screen, probably one of the most, it's probably the most uh, popular and most memorized scripture. Let's see what it says. I'm going to read it. For God so loved the world, that's everybody, everybody, saved and unsaved, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Funny that word belief's in there. We have, we have to believe God's word. Otherwise, there's parts that aren't going to engage, or are not going to take, or are not going to see the tower. And we just read in Psalm 25, 10, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and the truth unto such as keep his covenants and testimonies. So how about one of those testimonies? We see one in Psalm 86, verse 5. Here it is. This is a testimony of the Lord. For thou, Lord, art good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy. And who does that apply to? Unto all them that call upon thee. Do we get it? I, I don't think I have to explain that anymore. He's ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy, unto all that call upon him. God's mercy is either seen or it's unseen. It's there. It's there. It's either seen or unseen. Notice it's un incumbent upon us to keep ourselves in the love of God. To keep ourselves. 2 Samuel 24, 10, not on the screen. I have sinned greatly in that I have done and what I have done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. He, here again, he's, he's confessing. David's confessing. I have done foolishly. I wonder, do we have any foolish people in here? Do we have anybody that's ever been foolish, acted foolish, ignored God, looked it the other way? I did till I was 27, and I managed to work that in now and then after I'm saved because I'm not counting on God. Admit it. We've all been there. I bring up again Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Forgiven. Whose sin is covered in the blood of Jesus. Verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not, uh, the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Where's our sin? It's under the blood. We have a relationship with Christ. We have a relationship with... Read 1 John chapter 1. I'm not going to do it now. 1 John chapter 1. Just read that chapter. 
It's not all that long. The Sunday school class has read it many times in, in, the, in recent lessons. Because it talks about our fellowship with God, it talks about our fellowship with each other, and it talks about that we can confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all, unrighteous, all unrighteousness. Not part of it, but all of it. Because we have a relationship with God. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. By the mercy of God. The mercy of God. He's not up there watching. Hey, you're out of line. Hey, you're out of line. Hey, you sinned. Hey, you haven't read your Bible. No, he's up there. He's a merciful God. He loves us. He's calling us through his mercy. You got an issue in life that come up that you didn't plan on? God, that's, don't look at it as a mean God. That's God's mercy. He wants us closer. He wants us closer. No matter where you and I are in our walk with Christ, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. He, we're, tomorrow, he wants you closer to him than today. Today, you're closer than you were a year ago, a month ago, a week ago. He wants you, tonight, when you go to bed, he wants you to closer to him and a closer walk than you were when you got up this morning. That's God's way. And sometimes... Believers in Christ need a little encouragement. God knows how to do that. It's called his mercy. He didn't give up on us. It's his mercy. So do you and I really believe that? Do we believe it? And believe it. And believe it. That means serving the Lord as he has gifted you and me. That means serving the Lord as he has called you and me. And the gifting and the call match. He equips us doing what he wants us to do. Maybe God sees us as believers right in the middle of his will. And our trials are God trimming us back so we bear more fruit, John 15, 1 and 2. So I want you to, I want you to understand this morning, I'm not saying if something awkward, nasty, uncomfortable happens to you and you, I mean that it's always God giving his mercy to correct us or just draw us closer. But if we do look at if we do look at John 15, 1 and 2, the verse tells us that he, we like to use the word prune, he trims back the vine. Why does he do that? So it will bear more fruit. Kathy goes out and trims our plants and rose. We don't have uh, Grape vine. We have rose vines, rose plants, but she trims them, and then, ooh, more fruit comes forth. And that's the way God does that with us. So God may be extending his mercy on us for that reason. He may be extending his mercy on us to bring us back to him. He may bring us, be extending his mercy to us just to draw us closer and there may be some other reasons. They're all out of God's mercy. They're all to glorify him and to improve us as a believer in Christ walking in the light. Life's trials are not condemnation to those who believe. They are God's mercy in getting our attention. So we either repent or trust God even more, even more, and allow him to draw us closer as surely as Christ is returning someday, God will not go against his holy word. And his word says he loves us and his mercy is extended to us. I say hallelujah. Back to Jude 121. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What does it mean to stay in the love of God, I ask? and to look for his mercy. What does that mean? The answer is clear. Guess what? The Holy Word of God tells us that. One place is James 4.8. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. That's not on the screen. You've, you've read that. Draw nigh to God. Draw close to God, 
and he will draw close to us. That's a biblical fact. That's biblical truth. How do we stay close to God? How do we stay in his mercy? Oh, just get close to me. Draw close to me. How do we draw close to him? The word of God, prayer, fellowship with other believers, coming, worship and praise. Praise him. Praise him. Draw nigh unto me. It's so simple. Oh, I can't understand that Bible. Come close to me. I'll come close to you. Is that so hard? It's hard for the heart that doesn't want that. It's hard for the heart that wants God away. It's not hard for you and me. If we're walking the light, we want that. David stepped away. He sinned. And then he ran to God and says, God, forgive me. I repent. I I don't want to sin anymore. That's a relationship with God. That's counting on God. That's where God wants you and me. James 5.11. James 5.11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Tender mercy. Tender mercy. That's his heart toward us. He's tender. Sometimes he has to drop the two before. But he has. He, the Bible said, that's biblical fact. He, he, he has tender mercy for us. And that's where he wants us to recognize it. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So, with tender mercy, Jesus is waiting. He's waiting in your pews. He's waiting at the altar. Jesus is waiting softly and tenderly. Kathy. Kathy.